but the fire didn't ease up. For firemen, it was a monstrous task. Just when they thought they had beaten the fire, small pockets again flared up. With the odds stacked against them, this group of volunteers fought valiantly to hold back the fire. A garden hose was placed on the roof of the endangered home, as flames swallowed up a neighbour's house only a few metres away. One could not help feeling admiration for the volunteer firemen, particularly those from the local brigade. While many were out fighting to save other people's homes, their own were being engulfed in flames. Even knowing they had lost everything, the men continued to help save others. While the men battled the flames, their wives and children took refuge in a local kindergarten. Children were bedded down, unaware of the dangers so close around them. By 2.30, firemen began to contain the fire. As day broke out over the small township, a town that had suffered so much in so short a time, the awesome sight emerged. Everyone in the town knew that the fierce overnight fire caused extensive widespread damage. But never did they expect anything quite like this. Hundreds of families had lost everything. Nothing at all survived the savage flames. Irene Bishop and her family had lived in their home for over 20 years. Today, it's a pile of useless rubble. We've got nothing. We took two budgery guards with us and a few baby clothes, and I think women, my daughter and I might have a pair of slacks each, and that's about it. We just didn't have time to get anything. In a tragedy like this, volunteers have been quick to respond with offers of accommodation, food and clothing. As the day progressed, the true picture of the fire and its tragic results started to unfold. First, there was confirmation of four deaths, then eight, twelve, and then the news that shocked everyone. The death of 13 volunteer firemen. All died when their two water trucks were circled by flames in St George's Road, Upper Beaconsfield. The area has been blocked off as inquiries take place. The fire also claimed two other victims in the same street. And still the death toll climbs as the search continues in burnt out houses, outbuildings and cars. Shane Mooney, National 9 News. Further evidence of just how fierce these bushfires have been. The district still recovering from those savage bushfires of just two weeks ago has been completely devastated this time. The historic towns of Macedon and Mount Macedon are left now with just an odd few buildings standing. Colin Fulton was in the area right throughout the night and here's his report. This was the scene around the towns of Gisborne, Mount Macedon and Macedon last night. Thousands of hectares on fire, fanned by 120 kilometre winds. A few miles from Gisborne, the winds drove a river of fire across the Calder Highway. CFA volunteer firemen didn't try to stop this blaze, it was travelling too fast, and to stay was to risk almost certain death. Three kilometres away, the fire burst into the town of Mount Macedon and nearby Macedon. This is the main street of what was once a, a very beautiful little town, the town of Macedon. The homes on either side of the road here were more than a hundred years old. They were part of Victoria's heritage. And now they're totally wiped out, as you can see. There's the burnt out wrecks of cars and just the shells of houses. Behind me, there were eight homes, totally wiped out. A little bit further down the street, another five homes, totally wiped out. To my right, three homes. If you take the town of Macedon, the surrounding area, and the town of Mount Macedon, the total number of homes destroyed was in the order of 75 to 80 homes. I've been a journalist for something like 17 years. I covered the Lara bushfires and quite a number of bushfires since then, and yet I've never seen anything like this. Occasionally, as you look down the street, there's one house left standing. It's been left there by the vagaries of the fire and the wind that fanned it. Residents who fled the fire said conditions were chaotic as the driving wind and dense smoke cut visibility to less than a dozen metres. There were several accidents with cars running off the road and hitting power poles or striking other vehicles as their occupants tried to flee to safety. On at least two occasions, damaged vehicles caught fire and were destroyed. There were 600 CFA firemen in the area, fighting not one, but at least a dozen major fires which were all burning at once. As well as the 80 homes destroyed in the immediate vicinity of Mount Macedon, another 100 were destroyed in an arc stretching 10 kilometres from the mountain. One man who literally lost everything is Jack Hill. His family lost a total of five homes, plus their livelihood, the local sawmill. It was pretty rugged. With no way of staying back and saving? Well, I tried and uh, I couldn't. And uh, I had uh, family up at the hotel and the fire station went. And in that process, I was at a water trust meeting and uh, we had to uh, uh, get out of the water trust meeting because it looked that bad. It coming Once the wind changed, it come from, uh, uh, from that direction. And, uh, You've also lost your sawmill? 
Yes, lost the song, well, um, 90% of it. You lost pretty well everything. Yeah, lost a fair bit. Well, I've, had, I've lost it before. <laughs> when did you lose it before? In 42. Whereabouts? Out uh, in this area, out the uh, Blackwood Road. You going to stay out here? You going to rebuild again? I don't know. I'm, uh... <clears throat> I couldn't say. I've got a couple of boys. There's a couple of them there. We, we may. It'll, that'll uh, remain to be seen. I'm getting a bit into evening of my life. Nearby, Mount Macedon was also hit, although perhaps not quite as badly as Macedon. However, the damage is bad enough, as well as dozens of houses, the school, the post office, and the 110-year-old Uniting Church were razed. Yet once again, the fires seem to be selective, destroying some homes and buildings and sparing others. Darrell Dalton and Jim Jewell have a large two-story wooden house on Mount Macedon's main street. The buildings on both sides were destroyed, yet they stayed behind to fight the fire and won. Well, where else could we go? We couldn't go back down the hill. The fire was across the road over there and the ambers were coming across, so we had to stand and fight. We run our business from here and we've got responsibilities with our own people, so we had to make sure that we did everything that was absolutely possible. Right, you had two hoses and yet the house caught fire. How did you put it out? You put trees everywhere. Yeah, with branches and everything else to try and, you know... We sort of hit it with branches. We had buckets of water from the hoses. Every time we dropped the hose, we put it into a bucket to save the water. We got furniture and threw it out over the balcony and things like that, just to make sure that the fire was out of the house. By mid-morning, the first SEC crews were already attempting to bring power back to the area, but it will be a long job, at least until Sunday before electricity is available again. During the early morning, police moved through the area, shooting badly injured animals to put them out of their misery. In human terms, the cost was the highest. So far, there are two dead and one missing, and police fear that the toll could go much higher. Colin Fulton, National 9 News. Real estate is what there is not a lot of around this cockatoo district at the moment. And ironically, just behind me here, the ashen remains of what was one of the real estate offices in the main street of Cockatoo. Charred remains, the same as dozens of others scattered right throughout this whole cockatoo area. And across in the west of the state, the picture was just the same. Devastation and heartbreak. More than 40 farms and houses and properties lost over there. The far east of Warrnambool burnt almost 100,000 hectares, stretching from Terang in the north right through to Framlingham and Timboon. Peter Mitchell with this story. One of the worst affected country areas was east of Warrnambool. A belt of rich dairy farming property covering almost 100,000 hectares was wiped out. The death toll for this area is six. Four people were found dead in a burnt-out car near Garvok. Another man was found dead on the road near Tim Boone. Locals said he set off on foot to alert others. An 11-year-old girl died at the Tim Boone hospital from burns received in a fire near the town. At last count, more than 40 homes and properties in the area had been destroyed and countless head of cattle. In a cruel twist to the blaze, some houses were not affected at all while only just next door, their neighbours were confronted with total devastation. When the bushfire cut through the landscape with frightening speed late yesterday afternoon, locals were powerless. Telephone lines were down, train services stopped, and alternate accommodation had to be arranged for the thousands of people evacuated. The tiny primary school at Naringal, 20 kilometres from Warrnambool, was wiped out. The charred ruins were all that remained today. An indication of how quickly the blaze swept through the school could easily be seen. The 25 young children did not have time to save their push bikes as they were evacuated. Right alongside the school once stood the house of Naringal artist Robert Ullman, but he could not be found. Someone said he's gone interstate and is not coming back. North of Naringal, the enormity of the blaze was even more evident. A township called Framlingham was wiped from the map. Every house in the area was burnt to the ground and the wooden bridge linking the township with eastern Victoria collapsed under the fierce heat. The locals in this area, east of Warrnambool, won't forget this fire in a long time. The scarred countryside will act as a stark reminder. But if there is a positive side to all this, it's the people. People determined to rebuild and start again.